Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Love you, bud. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. You know, I died for about four minutes and uh, my heart just stopped and they were worried that, uh, you know, the oxygen would be cut off to your brain. If anyone knows what that's like and, you know, you, you can be retarded in certain ways and, and so forth. Um, but uh, the good news was I was talking to my wife and, and she put them at ease because she said, no, he's always been like that. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's normal for him, you know. Uh, so no, all good. People ask me, did you see anything? Uh, no, nah, it was just pitch black. Um, I should have come back and wrote a book. Yeah. You know, I mean, who's going to say you lied? <laughs> you know, no one can test you on it. I could have made some money, but I wasn't quick enough. Maybe the lack of oxygen, but... <laughs> hey, look, thanks, Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah. They're, they're just great friends of ours, and... Uh, um, we're just, I'm just honoured to be here tonight and, and to be able to preach the word to you. Um, you know, I've, uh, this whole year, the Lord spoke to me last year about harvest, about a season and a time of harvest for the church. And I know it's true because this is the worst year I've ever had pastoring. You know, it's like everything has come against us in a, in, in, you know, from left and right, whatever. But you know, the word of God n- never fails. Amen. It always prevails, and it always accomplishes that for which it's sent. And, uh, and so I was looking at that and, and uh, going through the scriptures, and I, I realized that, you know, some people believe salvation is the end goal. It's like you give your life to Jesus, and, uh, you know, you've made it, you're in, that's it. And uh, yeah, I love salvation. I, I remember, you know, after I gave my heart to the Lord at about age 25, and had a very rough life before that, but, but came to know Jesus, and it was just amazing. If you don't know him tonight, I encourage you, you know, don't wait. Because I turned to my wife and I said, I said, Annie, why did we wait so long? Like, why did we wait? This is so good. This is so wonderful. Why, why were we hesitating? Why did we wait so long? So salvation is amazing, and I I loved it when I came into the church and I learned how to be a father, I learned how to be a husband, you know, I learned how to be a man of God, and and, uh, through the Word of God and through great mentors, you know, in my life all around me. You see, my my parents were were alcoholics, and uh, they died that way, so I I didn't, didn't have a clue how to be a father. I didn't have a clue how to be, you know, um, a man. Uh, you know, I knew how to drink. That was basically all Dad could have taught me. But the reality was when I came into the body of Christ, the most wonderful thing was I saw that people could build a life that was absolutely amazing. And, and the, the, the benefits now is I've got, you know, three children and six grandchildren Um, You know, watching that generational blessing flow, I've got to tell you, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. And uh, amen. So, you know, the the vision over our church has always been to get them saved and build them for eternity. And I love that vision. God spoke it to me uh, 10 years ago, uh, that that vision. But, you know, as I'm reading through scriptures, I realise it goes just one step further. Because not only did the disciples experience a relationship with Jesus and, uh, and, you know, they started to listen to his teaching. They started to, you know, build their lives around the, the yoke of the Messiah, you know, the teachings of Christ. But he also sent them out. And I don't know about you, uh, the church in America, but in Australia, I think that's one area, as a pastor of 20 years, if I look back, you know, it's one area I haven't done well. Yes, we get them saved, and yes, we build them for eternity, strengthen their life, motivate them, build them. But not often have I personally, I confess to you tonight, made a, an absolute deliberate you know, target to send the disciples out. And, uh, and so I look in Scripture and I find that that's exactly what Jesus did. Turn over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 in your Bibles, I'm going to read verse 7 to 13.
It says here in this passage of Scripture, And Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals but, do, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that, that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Wow, what a powerful passage of Scripture. We see here that that Jesus actually sent out his disciples with the authority. And wow, that would have been so exciting. I want to have a look at this tonight. If you're taking notes, I've got four points. If I can encourage you to take those down. The first thing they had to do when they were sent out was they had to be faith ready. Faith ready. In verse 8 and 9 there, it talks about he gave them these instructions. You know, to take um, nothing for the journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. You know, wear sandals and not an extra shirt. In other words, position yourself at all times so you're free with the gospel. You're not encumbered. You're not, you're not overwhelmed by stuff and this and that and, and this. No, no, no. You've, you've gone focused. It was like Jesus was saying to the disciples, boys, I'm not sending you on a vacation. And if you happen to see a needy person or, or someone who needs help, well, just you know, say a little prayer for them. No, it wasn't that. He was saying, no, I'm sending you out deliberately on a mission. I don't want you to get distracted with all this stuff in your life. I want you to be totally faith ready for every opportunity that's presented to you. Isn't that cool? That they weren't to be encumbered by the things of this world. They will be free, ready to step out when the Holy Spirit moved. Incredibly powerful. The reality is, and, and you would know it as I do, that the more we add to our life, the more we're consumed. Is that true? Yes. You know, everything we own owns a piece of us. That's the way it is. I'm not saying don't have anything. All I'm saying is we need to calculate, you know, that we're not totally consumed by the things of this world so that when God wants to move in our life, you know, for some of us, he would have to take, in a, you know, a, a ticket, a number. Um, or, or make an appointment because we're so busy, we just, just don't have time, you know, for the Holy Ghost to move in our lives. I remember years ago when uh, I was growing up, I wasn't a Christian, but I remember that Sundays, you know, Sunday, life was very simple because Sundays, nothing, everything was shut down. Did that happen in America? Yeah. You know, uh, everything was shut down. Everyone went to church because there was nothing else to do. And, uh, and, you know, who remembers the Sunday lunch? You know, the, the baked dinner. Mum used to bake a dinner, Sunday lunch, and families actually ate together and, uh, and had a great time together as family. I remember that, even though my, you know, my family was dysfunctional, we still had Sunday lunch. Time to gather together. It was a simple time. It was a time, you know, where we could share and, and, uh, and so forth. But I think things are a little different these days, Amen. You know, there's so much on, there's so much to do. And as Pastor Jim said, you know, thank you for coming tonight. You know, there's a thousand places you could be, but you chose, you know, the, the house of God. And there's time for the word and there's time for prayer. And the, the result is when we make that time, we're faith ready. We're faith ready. Timothy, uh, in, in Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, he said, In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. He's charging him now. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. You know, be faith ready. Be faith ready. Put the, if we put the externals of life aside for the moment, what, what about our mind? How free is our mind 
of things and cares and stresses of this world, that if the Holy Spirit was to position us as a disciple of Christ to step out at that moment, would we, would we take it up? Would we pick it up? Would we go, oh, yes, and take that step of faith? Because I tell you what, if we don't, number two, if you don't, you're going to miss God appointments. As my second point tonight, that the God appointments, verse 10 shows us very clearly that whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. I guess it looked a little like this. The disciples would come to town and they would knock on doors. And, and it would sort of, you know, go like this. Uh, Hi, uh, my name's Byron. Um, God has sent me to your town. Uh, I'm to bring the gospel message and uh, to work miracles. Um, God has told me I, I've got to stay at your place um, for as long as I need to. Uh, and, uh, and you're to give me a room and feed me and look after me. And, uh, you know, what? There's two responses to that, isn't there? Now, the first one is, get off my porch, I'll call the sheriff. <laughs> you know, I love to say sheriff because we don't have them in Australia. You know, like, sheriff, you know, get the sheriff, 911. You know, I don't know. And, you know, that's the first response. But imagine if you as a believer in prayer that morning, opening up your heart before the Lord. And, and God says, listen, today, there'll be a knock on the door. That's my servant. And then I come along and I knock on the door and say, you know, uh, hi, I'm Byron. Um, you know, God's told me to come to this town and share the gospel. Come on in. The Lord's already spoken to me. That's a God appointment. Amen. I mean, it sounds ridiculous the other way, but if there was a God appointment, you know, we would walk straight into that miracle, straight into that opportunity that God has. I love that. I love it. The, the, Jesus is our example in Revelation 3.20. He says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. We don't know who the Holy Spirit has been communing with. We, we don't know, but, but he does. And we don't know that at any opportunity, if we're faith ready, that there could be that knock. Jesus could have been knocking on their heart for a very long time. And we were positioned right at that moment to be that, the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. You don't know the meals that you give that hungry person. You don't know this Thanksgiving, what's gone into that person's heart for months now. And at that point, with one meal, with one gesture of kindness and love towards the broken and the hurting, that if it's that moment that, that God has opened that door and that opportunity and they give their life to Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit knows. They were sent out and, and he prepared a way for them. I, I, I have a testimony of, I call them the German girls. In our church we have a, a young girl on staff and, and, and she was in a park one day. And uh, she saw these, uh, uh, this, this nanny. She was a German student that had come out to Australia. And, uh, um, you know, she was sort of, had, she was a nanny looking after a child in the park, you know. She was on sort of uni leave and, and uh, you know, travelling the world and working her way. And uh, Georgia, one of our girls um, in the office, saw her and, and just gave her a, uh, an invitation card and said, why don't you come to church? And just gave her that card. And, uh, and, you know, next Sunday, here's this girl. She's sitting about the second row right over there. And I'm preaching a message. Oh, it was a fantastic message, I've got to tell you. <laughs> That's a side thing. And, uh, and, you know, I'm preaching this message at the end. You know, I, I, I give an altar call for people to give their life to Jesus. And this beautiful German girl, her name was um, Judith. And uh, she, she just raised her hand. Come out and gave her heart to the Lord. Next week she bought another one. And it was Fania. Fania came with, with, with Judith. And, uh, and, you know, they come. And then the next week they bought a Swedish girl. We were breaking into the nanny industry. <laughs> we had a nanny ministry. 
going right on. The International Nanny Ministry was breaking. It was a flower opening up to us. And uh, it was amazing. And you know what? Fania's father came out to Australia. He was a businessman. He came out to Australia and he said to me, he saw the church and the girls got saved. Their lives were transformed. He said, please, he said, would you bring this, this church to, to Germany? He said, our, our young people need this. And next year, when my wife and I take our long service, we're, we're actually going to go to Germany and, and, and maybe call into that place. But imagine the opportunity that the Holy Spirit already presented because one person was faith ready and stepped in and took that opportunity. I've got to tell you, those girls, I, I, they, were, they were just transformed in a matter of weeks. Now they've gone back to Germany, most of them, and, uh, uh, you know, to wherever they lived, and, and they've taken the gospel back there in an amazing way. Isn't that good? Why don't you give the Lord a hand for that? But there's something I have to help you with right now, and, and, you, and the third point tonight is that you've got to reject rejection. Reject, rejection. Because in verse 11, uh, Jesus teaches his disciples. He said, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Because this is so powerful. This is a, I love the principle of shaking the dust off your feet. And we sung it tonight, didn't we? Moving forward. Moving forward. Because, you know, after a while, you, you know, you... You know, mud sticks. And you've got enough mud stick on your life, it gets heavy after a while. It becomes a bit of a burden. I tell you what, there's something in God that says, shake it off and let's move forward. Let's clean it up. Let's start today. Let's shake the dust off our feet. You know that, 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 that voice that keeps pulling you down every time. Shake it off. Shake the dust off. We're moving forward. We've got a destiny in God. Amen. We're moving forward. We're building the kingdom. We're rescuing humanity. Shake it off and move forward. Jesus was saying that not everybody is ready to receive the gospel. You know, you don't plant a seed on soil like this. It just, nothing will happen. It won't grow. And Mark tells us that in Mark 4.20, he said, Others like seeds sown in good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. And so we've got to understand that whenever we share the gospel, share a testimony, you know, love someone and tell them about Jesus, and they shut the door on that. We can't take that personally. It's not a rejection of you, it's a rejection of the word. Amen? And if we don't reject rejection, then that's going to feed our insecurity and I tell you what, we'll never do it again. We'll back away and think, well, I did that once. That didn't work. That was a clanger. Do you say that in America? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm never going to do that again. I mean, I stepped out for Jesus and, uh, you know, I caught one in the chin. and uh, No, no. Shake it off. Shake the dust off. You know, there's a destiny. There's a future. We're moving forward. Amen? Amen? Shake it off. Don't let that hold you back. Don't let that rob you. You know, the statistics tell us that in the first year, when, when, when a person gets born again, falls in love with Jesus, the light comes on, we get it. We're alive again. There's a, you know, the, 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 the Holy Spirit comes, brings us alive. You know, in that first 12 months, they say we tell 10 people about Jesus. Do you know, after that first year, we may tell one person in the next 10. Is that tragic? Same fire, same light, same revelation, same fruit of the Spirit. Yet we don't speak anymore. Why? Because we haven't rejected rejection. We've taken it personal. You know, a pastor, a friend of mine, was preaching a message about the strongholds of the heart. The strongholds of the heart. And you know, every time we agree with one of those negative strongholds in our heart, it gets stronger. But every time we shake the dust off, 
Every time we just shake the dust off and say, forget it, I'm moving forward. I'm going, I'm knocking on the next door. I'm knocking on the next door. I'm knocking on the next door. You know what happens? That stronghold crumbles. And I become freer and stronger. Because it's really not about me anymore. We share our testimony with people and sometimes they reject it. You know what? That's okay. They're just not ready yet. You know, I remember telling, uh, I had a wife in my office who was, her husband didn't know Jesus yet and he was, he was just being difficult about it. And I said, look, you know, you, you've got to cut the guy some slack because he doesn't see it. I said, it's like sitting on a couch watching the football with a blind person. And sitting there going, oh, did you see that pass? Did you see that tackle? Did you see that touchdown? And they're like, well, no, hello, I'm blind. <laughs> you wouldn't get angry at that person. You wouldn't get angry at that person because they didn't see it because they're blind, would you? Then, then why do we get angry at people who have never got the revelation you have? See it for what it is. Shake the dust off. Don't be offended. Don't be affected by that. And understand that one day they will. Yeah. One day they will. One day they'll see it. And it'll be powerful. Because the fourth point tonight is the most powerful. You don't want to miss out on this. It's the supernatural walk. Look at verse 13. It says, They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. In verse 12, it says that they went out and preached that people should repent. See, this is not a signs and wonders crusade. You know, this is not that the healing evangelists coming to town and bring the sick and bring the needy and God will heal them. No, no, no. This is, this is the disciples seeing the miraculous happen in the very streets they live. The very streets they live. They saw the miraculous because they were prepared to step out. They were faith ready. They saw God appointments. They weren't prepared to be held back by rejection. And they had the supernatural walk. He sent them and gave them authority. And when they went out, they saw the supernatural in the streets. Amen? Yeah. I want that. Do you want that? You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I, I mean, I love church. I love, I'm a pastor. I live for church. Sunday is my big day. I love it. I love the people coming together, praising God, the family, the body of Christ, strengthened together. I love that. Worship, praise in the house, the anointing. When I was standing over there, when these guys were worshipping, and I was like, oh, I love that. But what happens when that friend of yours is broken? And needy, and it's a Tuesday. Or that young person you know that's threatening to commit suicide, but it's Wednesday. Say, so look, wait, can you wait till Sunday? I'll take you to church Sunday. No, it may be too late Sunday. It's a good thing to do to bring them, but more better on the spot, walk in the supernatural of God. Start to reach out, start to speak in faith, start to destroy the voices that keep them bound and keep them broken. And we can do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, amen? The reason for that is because we are the body of Christ, we are the disciples of Christ, we are the sent ones. We're the sent ones, yes, we're the church and we're proud of that, we love that, that's amazing, but we're the ones that are sent out to see the supernatural in our daily lives. We are the body of Christ. The supernatural power of God is not dead. Amen? Amen. Supernatural power of God is not dead. It's just waiting for some hands and feet and a voice to proclaim it. Amen? Amen. Proclaim it. Who we are. We are the disciples of Christ. It's wonderful that we've received salvation. Amazing. It's wonderful that, you know, the Word and the Spirit is building us into the men and women of God that we need to be. But we are the sent ones that need to take what God has poured into our life 
and begin to see the supernatural in our everyday. Now, folks, I'm not talking about flaky stuff. We call them Fruit Loops in Australia. Do you have Fruit Loops here? You know, they scare me. Do they scare you? These Fruit Loops, I, I, you know, I don't want to be unkind, but that's not what I'm talking about. You know, I, I was talking to a guy one day and he, Jesus speaks to him so much, it's no wonder he doesn't talk to me. He's always talking to him. I said, could you just, you know, God told me this and God told me that and God told me this and God told me that. I said, wait a minute, can you show, oh, tell me something. <laughs> Give me a turn. I'm not talking about flaky stuff. I'm talking about understanding that if you position yourself and you free your life ready for those opportunities, it's not going to happen every day, maybe. You know, but when it does, you're there. When it does, you're ready. You're not encumbered. You're not held back. You're not too busy. You're listening. You're ready. You know, you're you're faith ready to take that God opportunity. You're not worried about the fear of man. Because when you walk in the supernatural of God, nothing compares to that. Amen? Nothing compares to that. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a Christianity any other way. You know, I didn't save to become a church in. I became a Christian. And I'm a sent one. And I have authority to go out and do what he's called me to do. And you know, so do you. I think one of the reasons that a lot of believers don't fully complete their mission is that they don't think they've got permission to do that. Maybe no one's ever said, you know, look, This is part of the deal. You're required to do this. I want you to know tonight that if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, this is part of the deal. Yes, we embrace salvation and it's amazing. Yes, God is is awesome with building our lives and strengthening our families and giving us, you know, just that that connection and wisdom and, and all that that's in the Word of God. Amazing stuff. But we must be the sent ones as well. We must get up and go out there and make a difference. That's all part of the deal. Amen? It's the whole thing. It's not just part of it. It's the whole thing. And uh, I tell you what, that's when your Christianity comes alive. But can I challenge you tonight, can we just start with one life? Just with one life. I'd like you to close your eyes right now just for a moment. I want you to see that person in your mind's eye right now. There's one person in your world. It can be in the workplace. It can be in the, on the sporting field. It can be in the college, the school, the university. Wherever you are, whatever your sphere of influence in is, there's a person. There's one life. One life. One life. And the Holy Spirit will put that face in your mind's eye because they're ready. They're ready. You know that. They may not look like it, but you don't know what goes in their mind when they lay their head on that pillow at night. You don't know what happens in that heart when no one else is watching and no one else is around. When it's public, there's a great bravado. But when they're alone, there's a great breaking. And Holy Spirit, come right now. Put that, put that one life, that one life in our minds right now. Send us into that life with a message of salvation and freedom and deliverance and wholeness in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you pray for that person? Will you pray for that person? Will you you not let that picture leave your mind? Within the next 12 months. Now the reality is if, if every, everyone in this church just led one person to Jesus in 12 months, this church would double in size. It's not rocket science, it's very simple. Just one person a year, a year in 12 months. Just one person, all of us, every believer, just one person. And if we did it the next year, you know it would double again. 
And there would be so many people finding Jesus that the newspapers would come and, and Charisma magazine would come and they'd interview your pastors and they'd say, what's going on? This must be revival. It's not revival, folks. It's just believers being believers. It's just believers in Jesus Christ doing what they're called to do. The sent ones. Amen? Amen? Why don't you give the Lord a hand? I'm going to ask Pastor to come. Anybody enjoy that besides me? Amen. God is so good. Before we close tonight, just want to make sure everybody's right with God before you go. Now let's just talk for a moment. Is that okay? Like Byron was saying, there's some of you here tonight, you know who Jesus is in your head, but let me be frank with you. Is that okay if I can just be kind of like up front and in your face for a moment? If you were to die tonight, you wouldn't make it. Some of you say to yourself, well, I think I would go to heaven. Nowhere does it say in the Bible that you can have positive thinking and make it to heaven. Some of you say to yourself, well, I hope, you know, if I died tonight, I hope, you know, pastor, I'd go to heaven. But nowhere does it say in the Bible, nowhere that you can hope your way into heaven. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. It doesn't work that way. Some of you say to yourself, well, you know, I love God a whole lot. I, I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. I'm here tonight, aren't I, Pastor? I'm, I'm in church. I love God. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, now listen to this, isn't this one? I would think this is different, but it, it's true. Nowhere in the Bible it says because you love God, you get to go to heaven. Did you know that? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. That's not how you get to heaven. Some of you say to yourself, well, pastor, you don't understand. I, I, I you know, I, I joined my last church. It was a Christian church, sang in the choir, helped the pastor out. You know, I was a leader in that church. I'm just visiting this place tonight. That's great. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you go to church, help the pastor out, sang in the choir, was a leader in the church, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough. Now think about that. Love you, respect you, and honor you enough to stop playing church and tell you like it is. Somebody needs to love you enough to get in your face before it's too late. Wow. And tonight, you have a divine appointment with God, not only just to come because someone invited you, not just come because it's the thing to do. You didn't have any place else to go. God saw you before the foundation of the world that you would be in this place tonight. You have a divine appointment with God tonight. This is your night of salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, wait a minute. You just don't understand. My mom and dad told me when I was a child, I was a Christian. Well, they said, you know, we're... we're we're born in America, we went to church, I, we went to that denominational, nice little denominational church, and, and I, I went through catechism class, or Sunday school, or Sabbath school class, and you know, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Nowhere does it say because you went to those classes. Nowhere does it say because you think of yourself in a positive manner as a Christian that you get to go to heaven. Did you know that? Did you know that the Bible makes it very clear? Jesus makes a statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here's what Jesus said. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. No, you can't make it. You're not going to make it man's way. If you're going to get to heaven, and you know darn well you want to make it. So listen to me. You're going to have to get there God's way. And Jesus tells us exactly in the scripture how to get there. It's like, how did we miss this in American churches? It's as clear as a bell. Jesus said, John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. Now, when I use the terms born again, everybody immediately, like in America, turns off. 
Do you know why you just turned off when I use the words born again? Because movies, television, magazines, stories that are being told talk about crazy, fanatical, weirdo, born again people. Like Hollywood has presented born again people as idiots. And you don't want any part of that. And well, I don't want you to be an idiot either. And that's not what God's talking about. What Hollywood, Hollywood has no idea about how to get to heaven. Here's what born again means from the beginning of your Bible to the end of your Bible. It means you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. Now listen to me. What God is after for each and every one of us is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. All or nothing. Bottom line, that's it. The whole Bible is there to tell you that you're going to have a choice in front of you to give him all of your heart or not give him all of your heart. You can't give him part of it and make it to heaven. You can't give him a little bit and make it to heaven. You're going to have to give it all. It's an all or nothing thing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Last book. You know, you've heard the book of Revelation. In Revelation, it says these words. Jesus is speaking himself. His own mouth. His own words. And he says, I'm coming again. And you know he is. We just don't know when, but we know he is. Could even be tonight. But watch this. He says, when I come, I better find you. 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 You, 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 you. I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What a blunt and rude statement from the mouth of Jesus. I will vomit you from my mouth? What kind of a statement is that? He's making a statement that lukewarm people who call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. What's lukewarm? A little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. What's lukewarm? A token prayer, occasional church attendance, lukewarm. What's lukewarm? You know, you're not against Jesus. Now watch this. Lukewarm. You're not against Jesus, but you're not wholehearted for Jesus. Uh, in other words, you know, he's like everything else in your life. He's something. But until you make him everything, you won't make it to heaven. He's got to be your everything. All in all. He's got to be your everything. And the only way that happens is you give God what he's after. All of your heart and all of your life. And that's your choice that your call, not mine, not the people you came with, not the preacher in the television or the preacher on the platform. It's your call whether you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Now someday you're going to do that. But today is the day you could start life by giving him all of your life tonight in this safe, friendly place. Tonight, we can give God. There's some of you out here that have never really given God. You know who he is or you wouldn't be here. You can even say, Jesus is Lord. I understand that. You can sing the songs. You know them by heart. You can even quote some scripture. But guess what? You have really never released all of your heart to him and never given him all of your life. You're still holding on to half of it for yourself. And you've got to give it all. And tonight... Someone loves you enough to tell you the truth. It's an all or nothing relationship. And you cannot make it to heaven by being a little in and a little out, a little up, a little down, lukewarm. And you've got to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. And if you've never given it to him, then this is a safe, friendly, a divine, that means God appointment for you. To give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Why not? You say, well, pastor, how do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it my way. Let's don't do it your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, hear me now, hear me, hear me. If you deny me, I'll deny you. When the time comes in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, 
two, three, I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up all over this auditorium. What you're saying by the raising of your hand, watch this, watch this, watch this. You're saying, I want Jesus to give him all of my heart, give him all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. You don't want to go to hell and you're raising your hand, making a public statement. What does Jesus say? When you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father is mine. But if you deny me, sit there and do nothing it's your call. And when the time comes, and God's not a liar, he won't want to do this, but he'll do it. He'll have to deny you. He'll say, go from me, a worker of iniquity. I know you not. That's what the scripture says tonight. It's your call. But somebody needs to fight for you. You know why? Because the devil's fighting real hard right now for you not to do it. But if you don't let him do that, you, I'm fighting for you because I love you. Telling you the truth. And you need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are not sure if you have or where you're at with God, if you've I'm not sure. I love him a lot. I go to church a lot. I read my Bible, but I, I'm not sure if I've ever really given him all of my heart, given him all of my life. Well, make sure. It's silly not to make sure. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham and on television, or you prayed at a Harvest Crusade, but did you give him all of your heart? Or are you just hoping some magical little abracadabra words called prayer gets you to heaven? Don't treat God like he's an idiot. It's not about the prayer, it's about the heart. And tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three, pop my hand on this pulpit area, all across this auditorium. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, hold on, stop, stop. I can't raise my hand. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you will be. Get over it. Better to be embarrassed in the house of God for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Come on! No one's that dumb, but the devil thinks you're dumb enough to try to talk you out of it right now. Don't let anything stop you or hold you back. I'm counting. Here it is. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. 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 There's one, thank you. There's two, thank you. There's three, thank you. God bless you. On this side over here, where are you? There's four, thank you. There's five back in this family room, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else, real quick? There's, a, there's, a, I, I, I counted, there's, I counted two in that family room. Thank you. Anybody else? Right over here, there's six. Where, where are you? Wave at me if that's your hand up somewhere. I got you. Okay, six, thank you. There's another one back here in that family. I think I call it seven, eight, thank you. Don't let anything stop you from coming to God. These people, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Don't miss this time when you can get right with God right here in this safe, friendly place. There's already like eight people. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, I'm going to cut it off and you're going to miss it. And I feel so bad about that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, for seven or eight people, let's give the Lord a great big praise. We do that? Here's what I want you to do. All seven or eight of you in the family room, I want you to get your kids, bring them. It's okay. Ushers, let's get up and help these folks to get out of the family room. Would you do that if you're an usher? Help these folks get, get out of the family room. If there's ushers back here, would you help the people out of the family room? If you raised your hand, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. If you didn't raise your hand, you know you should have. I want you to get a hold of your stuff. Come on, nudge your neighbor right now and say, come on, I'll go with you. If you'll go, I'll go. Come on, let's go. Just nudge your neighbor and get your stuff. Get out of your seat and meet me right here in front. We're going to pray to receive Jesus and change the life in the course of your eternity. So if you raised your hand or if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, get out of your seat and come right now. Come, 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 Jesus, come, come, come. I come. In you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Come on, give me a hand as they you're come. The They're coming. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, 
Once I believe in you. They're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that Come on, I come on. You can come too. Come on. We'll wait for you. Come on. Let's give them a hand as they come. Jesus, I They're still coming. There's time for you to come. Come on. Get out of your seat. Come. Come on home. Give Jesus all of your heart. Give Jesus all of your life. Just get out of your seat and come. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that They're still coming. Give them a hand. Don't stop yet. This is a good thing. I believe in you. Isn't God good? Well, thank God. You guys, anybody else? Real quick. Hurry. Don't miss this. You're going to send them out and you're going to miss it and you don't want to do that. Well, thank God you guys have come, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to morgue, you're going to heaven. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, now look, over here is my friend, Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. Only takes a few moments. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. What I mean by that, he has a program called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll tell you what all of that means. It just takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. He'll let you come right back out to your seats. Just go right over there with Pastor Joel. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Thank you, Lord. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.